Streams offer a variety of habitats that support many types of aquatic life. Macroinvertebrates are those organisms that do not have backbones but are large enough to be seen without the aid of a microscope. Monitoring macroinvertebrates gives us an idea of water quality over time since they live all or parts of their lives in the water. This differs from parameters such as temperature, which gives us just a snapshot of water quality at the moment of monitoring. Now here's Chris Stepanek, Volunteer Stream Monitoring Coordinator, to tell you more about aquatic macroinvertebrates and their role in assessing water quality. Our uses of the land affect the habitat and the quality of water in the stream, which both affect the type of organisms that can survive in the water. An important factor for survival in a stream is the amount of oxygen available for aquatic organisms. The availability of oxygen in water is related to pollutants that reach the waterway. You can learn more about this in the dissolved oxygen portion of the DVD. In relation to macroinvertebrates, it's important to understand that different types of macroinvertebrates have varied needs for oxygen. There are organisms that are sensitive, semi-sensitive, semi-tolerant, and tolerant to pollutants that affect oxygen levels in the water. A water quality rating or biotic index score can be determined by sampling for macroinvertebrates, identifying them, and then assigning higher scores to sensitive organisms and lower scores to tolerant organisms. Before you can begin sampling though, you must assess your site to determine where to sample from. There are a variety of habitats within streams that provide food and offer shelter and attachment sites for macroinvertebrates. Riffles, rocky shallow water areas where water is flowing quickly, provide the greatest diversity in terms of available habitat for invertebrates. With abundant oxygen supplies available and with many nooks and crannies between and on rocks for macroinvertebrates to attach to. Undercut banks are considered the next most diverse habitats for macroinvertebrates in a stream, with their many roots, rocks, or logs, and with overhanging vegetation offering an additional habitat. Snags and tree roots also provide habitat to macroinvertebrates. Another good site, though less diverse than the others, is a leaf pack, which provides habitat for organisms such as these scuds. At your site, you should seek to collect as many kinds of macroinvertebrates as possible and sample from a minimum of two habitats to ensure accurate site assessment. Keep in mind that you should attempt to sample from habitats with the most diversity first. Generally, that means favor sampling from riffles, but don't ignore the other habitats entirely. Later in this segment, we'll give you examples about how to plan sampling at your site, but first we're going to explain a little bit more about how to collect your sample. To monitor the biotic index, you need several pieces of equipment. You need hip boots, you need your recording form and a pen. You need a magnifying glass. You need a spoon or other equipment that can, you can use to sort macroinvertebrates from the sample debris. You need a white dish pan, a white ice cube tray, and a D-frame net. A D-frame net is called that because it has one flat side that you place on the bottom of the stream, and it has a mesh net in the bottom that will catch the macroinvertebrates as they're dislodged from their habitat. You can use the D-frame net in a number of different ways depending on the habitat that you're sampling, but first you need to know how to collect a complete biotic index sample. A complete biotic index sample consists of three subsamples collected from different habitats in the stream. The tricky part is that when you collect at a riffle, you need to collect both at the downstream and the upstream ends of the riffle and combine those samples together to make one subsample. When you're collecting from a riffle, you want to approach from the downstream end and move upstream, placing your D-frame net on the bottom of the stream, then moving to the upstream side of the net and beginning to kick the bottom of the stream to dislodge macroinvertebrates. You can also rub rocks so that the macroinvertebrates are dislodged from the rocks and flow into the net. You want to do this combination of kicking and or rubbing rocks for two minutes at which point you'll scoop up your net, come over to the side of the stream, and pour the contents of the net into a dish pan that has about an inch of water in it. You can rinse the net into the water, then check the net for any remaining macroinvertebrates, which you can pick from the net and place into the dish pan. Once you've done this, you'll move to the upstream end of the riffle Replace your net on the bottom, kick for two minutes once again or rub rocks, then pour the contents of the net into the dish pan. Now that we've done riffle sampling, we're going to move on to other habitats. 
This habitat is an example of an undercut bank. You can see a little bit about it by seeing the vegetation that's overhanging that bank. When you're sampling an undercut bank area, you're going to use the D-frame net a little bit differently than you did in the riffle. In this case, you'll take the D-frame net and put it underneath the undercut bank and scrape along the top of that undercut bank to dislodge the macroinvertebrates. You'll do 20 jabs into the undercut bank to equal one subsample. After you've done that, you'll take it out as before and you'll dump the contents of the D-frame net into the dish pan as you did in the riffle. Now that we're done with an undercut bank, we'll move on to another habitat. This is an example of a snag. It's a log that's entered the stream that's providing habitats for macroinvertebrates to attach to. Like an undercut bank, you use your D-frame net to jab underneath the snag and scrape along the bottom of it to dislodge the macroinvertebrates. You'll do 20 jabs to equal one subsample at a snag. Once you've done the 20 jabs, like before, you'll take the contents of the net and dump them into the dish pan. Let's go check out one more habitat. The last habitat type we'll look at today is how to sample from a leaf pack. To do this, you'll position your net downstream from the leaf pack and then dislodge the leaves so that as many as possible flow into the net. Once you've done this, you'll do like before and pour the contents of the net into your dish pan. To review, a complete biotic index sample consists of three subsamples combined together into one. For ripples, you'll kick for two minutes both at the downstream and upstream ends of the riffle. For undercut banks and snags, one subsample is equal to 20 jabs of the net into that habitat. The goal of leaf pack sampling is to collect as much of the leaf pack as possible in your net. We'll now go through two examples to help you assess how to sample at your site. Riffles are lacking from this site, but you have both undercut banks and a snag to sample from. In order to sample from the most diverse habitat, you want to focus your attention on the undercut banks with two subsamples being collected from the undercut banks and your third subsample being collected from the snag. This site is dominated by riffles, but there's also undercut banks from which to sample. In order to focus your sampling on the most diverse habitat, you'll want to collect two subsamples from the riffles and do your third subsample from the undercut banks. Now that you know how to collect your sample and from which habitats, we'll show you what to do next. Now that you've collected your biotic index sample, the next step is to sort the macroinvertebrates from the sample debris. Mike and Adam are here to help with that, and they've already started on one of the samples we collected. There's a number of tools you can use, including a paintbrush to scoop up and under the macroinvertebrates, or a baster, or a spoon, again, to scoop up and under the macroinvertebrates, and to sort similar-looking macroinvertebrates into different cubes of the ice tray. Once you've sorted your macroinvertebrates, you can use the biotic index recording form to circle the macroinvertebrates that you find. The index is based on a presence and absence, so you don't need a total count of each organism. You record it the same whether you find one or a hundred. Let's do some sorting. A biotic index assesses water quality based on the organisms living in the water. The Water Action Volunteers biotic index is based on macroinvertebrates, that is, organisms without backbones that are visible without the aid of a microscope. The macroinvertebrates used in the biotic index were specifically chosen because, number one, they are ubiquitous. That is, they are found in streams and rivers all over the world. Two, they are not very mobile, so they cannot escape pollution inputs very easily. Three, they live a portion or all of their life cycle in the water. And four, they utilize oxygen from the water to live, not oxygen from the air. So Adam, what do you have there? Damselfly. So Adam knows that this macroinvertebrate is a damselfly, but if you don't know what you have in your sample, you can use what's called the key to macroinvertebrate life in the river to figure it out. The first question to ask is whether or not the macroinvertebrate has a shell or no shell. Because this doesn't have a shell, you see if it has legs or no legs. It has legs, so we find, does it have 10 or more pairs of legs? four pairs of legs or three pairs of legs. This one has three pairs of legs, so the next question is whether or not it has wings or no wings. It has no wings, so we find does it have no obvious tails, one or two tails, or three tails. It has three tails, so we look through the pictures 
and the words to decide which macro invertebrate we have. As Adam told us, he has a damselfly. Once you've sorted it and identified all your macro invertebrates, the last step to calculate your biotic index is to count the number of types of organisms that are circled in each group and write that number in the box provided. Enter each box number in the workspace for each group on the back of your recording form. Multiply the entered number from each group by the group value and do this for each of the groups. Total the number of macroinvertebrates that are circled and then total the calculated values for all the groups. You divide the total values by the total number of types of organisms that were found and record this number. This is your biotic index score. So to summarize, the key steps to remember when collecting and determining your biotic index score are first, to collect three subsamples and focusing on the most diverse habitats first. Sort your sample, identify, and then determine the biotic index score. Many people find studying macroinvertebrates to be the most enjoyable part of volunteer monitoring. In addition, it provides valuable information for assessing water quality. Macroinvertebrates are an important part of the food chain, providing a source of food for fish and other organisms. Also, they live in the water for many months or a year or more, so the water quality needs to be adequate throughout that time in order for them to survive. If you would like to learn more, view the macroinvertebrate section of this DVD series.